What happened at the end of last year in that Wuhan in China, they believe, again, this is just partially, that somehow the virus there was transmitted to humans by association with animals. It's a, a bad virus originally, but then animals can get infected with it. And by handling the animals, the live animals, eating them either undercooked or raw, which are some of their customs, somehow humans got infected. And it started spreading within close uh, quarters, like in families, human to human. And ultimately, when the virus got the ability to go from human to human very easily, that's when everything changed. And then they started seeing cases increase tremendously. And we were on the verge of developing the pandemic that we now see. Unfortunately, around the same time this was happening, they had a big Chinese New Year celebration. Millions of people came to that very area. Millions of people from there then flew back all over the world. And that's how the virus then got disseminated. And this is a virus, the reason why it's so dangerous and why it becomes a pandemic, it's a new virus that has never been in humans. So humans have no immunity at all. And because of that, and its ability to spread in droplets as a respiratory virus like flu, it's very contagious and spreads very quickly. And here we are today, over a million cases in the world, over 100 countries, and thousands of deaths. It's a respiratory virus, so it enters through the respiratory tract. And most people will have mild to moderate illnesses, fever, cough. Um, some get more severe illness, shortness of breath. Usually when you start seeing shortness of breath, it means it's gotten into the lungs. And that's where the problems are. Once the virus gets into the lungs, it can cause a very, very rapidly progressive severe pneumonia that ends up in respiratory failure, what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome and death. But more and more data suggesting that people can walk around and don't have symptoms, and that even in talking, um, you're spreading a little bit of the virus. Certainly, you're not as contagious when you don't have symptoms as you are when you're actively coughing and sneezing and very sick. That's when you have the most uh, contagiousness to somebody near you. They're suspecting that it may end up becoming like a seasonal virus where we'll see it resurge again on, in the fall or next year sometime. Ultimately, over time, as more people are exposed to it, more people have antibodies, it's going to die out more. And then it won't be such a big problem. It'll be an occurrence, but not on the magnitude that we're seeing here, which is a pandemic. So the blood test that they're looking at, there's several out now. They're, they're not all that sensitive or specific, so they're testing them out. But once we can measure with whether somebody has antibodies to this virus in their blood, if they have the IgG antibodies, that usually means they're immune. If they have just IgM, you see those in acute infection. So it's the IgG antibodies that would indicate that somebody's gotten over the infection and has immunity. And it is these antibodies that they're looking to um, obtain from people who want to donate them, who've recovered from it, to then prepare and give to people who are still suffering from it to help them fight the virus. So that's why it would be helpful for, for healthcare workers to be tested because it could be that a lot of them may have been exposed, may have had some clinical infection or mild infection, now have antibodies. They should be able to work without being afraid because they have antibodies that would indicate they can keep the infection from developing into a infection in their body, but keep it controlled, you know, prevent from getting active infection. And I think they're pushing out to see if we can get that blood test available so that healthcare workers could be screened with it and know whether they're immune or not, which would definitely give them peace of mind when they're going to fight you know, the virus in patients who are infected and very sick. I mean, there are some studies showing that certain combinations of medicines work. Everybody's heard about the hydroxychloroquine with the Zithromax. Zithromax is a common antibiotic that z that people take for when they have an upper respiratory bacterial infection. Shouldn't be given for viruses, but anyway, it does have some activity against the virus, as does hydroxychloroquine, and that's a, a drug that was developed as an antimalarial drug, but it's also anti-inflammatory, and it's used in people with connective tissue disorders like lupus, rheumatoid. It helps decrease the immune system response. And we believe the studies in um, patients who have gotten this in Europe and China, other parts of the world where they've used it, show that people who got the hydroxychloroquine, either with or without the Zithromax, um, had a better chance of surviving. It's not definitely proven, but there's definitely um, anecdote or what we call real-time evidence that people seem to have gotten better, but it hasn't yet been proven in a clinical trial where you're comparing you know, placebo to the drug. So we are all using it because it's, there's not much else we can do, so we're using it. And we're seeing some good results in our patients. Some patients, despite getting it, don't get better, but there are a lot we don't understand. And some of it is especially when you get to really sick patients, there we don't know how well it works. It works best early in the infection. So patients who come in with fever, cough, and they have pneumonia and x-ray, and risk factors we're tending to give it up front. Zinc has been shown. Some people feel it's helpful. It can hurt. Um, staying healthy is really important. Getting enough rest, drinking a lot of water, staying hydrated, you know, avoiding crowds of 
all the things you do, good sleep, healthy food, you know, staying healthy will help you fight better too. There's no magic here, but all those things together will help you fight it better if you get exposed. Um, that up to 70% of the population could get the virus, but estimates range anywhere from 20 to 60, 40, depending how well we are at preventing it from spreading, the social distances, and that's why they're recommending that we extend this stay at home, you know, don't go out in public, stay six feet away from people. Those things we're all hoping will mitigate it. So we're not going to see as many cases, and we're hoping to avoid the really big peak that would overwhelm our health systems. Ultimately, when they see the numbers ease out, when the uh, new cases start decreasing, the people that are recovered start increasing, the deaths start decreasing, then hopefully we'll be at the point where we'll be able to start going more back to normal. I think we'll never be quite normal again because people are going to be more aware than ever of the need to um, wash your hands, hopefully, you know, rub down common surfaces, so we'll hopefully be better after we get through all this, you know, God willing, if we get through in a way that we'll be able to keep up with it and not end up being overwhelmed by the number of people that will have this infection, have serious infection with it. I'm hopeful, yes, definitely hopeful. But we'll get a vaccine eventually, that I know. There's other drugs they're looking at. Um, they're looking at using plasma of people who've recovered to help people who are really sick. And those are all things we've used way back even now with the Spanish flu. We had people who had recovered donating their blood, taking the plasma out and giving it to patients who are really sick, and that's always worked. So there's drugs and trials. There's the vaccine, several vaccines coming out. But they probably won't realistically be an option until at least a year from now. So social distancing is our biggest mitigation, is our biggest thing until we can get through this year. Yeah.